In 2 Chronicles 7.14, God outlines three precepts for spiritual healing. Humility, hunger, and holiness. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Lord, hear our cry. As your church, we call on you. Through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we pray in every nation, Christ be known.
speak through your word. We pray in every nation, Christ be known, our hope and salvation, Christ The National Day of Prayer is an annual day of, of observance held on the first Thursday of May when people are asked to turn to God in prayer and mediation. Annually, the president is required by law to sign a proclamation each year encouraging all Americans to pray on this day. Also on this day, the people of different faith are invited to pray for the United States of America and its leaders. This year's theme is pray fervently in righteousness and avail much. Our National Day of Prayer goes back to the 1700s when in 1775, the Continental Congress asked people to pray for the fledging nation. This initial declaration gradually evolved into two formalized events. In 1863, President Lincoln oversaw the naming of the autumn observance of prayer and thanks as Thanksgiving Day. In 1952, President Truman signed this holiday into law. Every president since has signed a proclamation that encourages Americans to pray and celebrate on this day. Annually, over 40,000 Prayer gatherings are held every year at churches, courthouses, mosques, synagogues, temples, and schools, which means millions of people are participating in this day of prayer, many at interdenominational prayer events. Thank you, Antioch, for supporting this day that God has made. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this National Day of Prayer, a day that you have made, a day in which family and friends of Antioch have come in your name to give you thanks and to seek your will in helping our nation to come together. We thank you for the love you have shown us and for your mercy and grace. We seek you, Lord, for unity, harmony, and oneness. We know, Father, that you're the only one we can look to for guidance. Therefore, this morning, we come to you in prayer. And as we go forward with our program, our prayers are that you are here with us and that your Holy Spirit will lead us. Empower us, O oh Lord, to make every effort to live in unity. We give you all the glory for this day and our nation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Antioch. Thank you, Brother Lancy, for that welcome, for the invocation. It is certainly an honor to be here with you today, here in the sanctuary, and those who are watching us virtually. It is a blessing to be here after two years of COVID, because there's nothing like being in the house of prayer to worship. So thank you for coming out. So I'm humbled to be asked to serve as your Masters of Ceremonies today. I know there have been many who've stood in this place before me. And as we go forward, we just know that there is much prayer when we come together and we lift it up in, uh, as God's people. Because we believe that the power of prayer is in the one who answers and hears it. So every time we pray, we draw on God's grace. And first in our celebration is going to be Deacon Green. He's going to share about the grace of God and what he's done in his life. I'm an Antioch deacon, and I've been on sabbatical for the last three years. The reason for my being on sabbatical provides the basis for this testimony. 
I'll be using notes because I want this discussion to remain on topic. This testimony would not have existed without the efforts of my wife, Joyce, my three adult children, and several men members of Antioch. Each of my family members profess Christ as God and work in our individual churches. Joyce has been my caretaker. In early May of 2019, I believed I was in reasonably good health, and I had planned on participating in my first golf tournament. However, on the day of the tournament, I was in a military hospital being treated for a strange blood infection. After undergoing a battery of tests and consuming meds to treat the infection, I was discharged to my home. While in the hospital, members of Antioch visited me and prayed for and with me. The prayers focused on my, me, my wife, and healing of the infection. I was discharged from the hospital after four days with medication to continue treating the infection. A few days later, my urologist called and told me that the scans I had undergone during my hospital stay revealed that I had prostate cancer. This was quite a shock since none of the, my relatives, to include my father, had not contracted prostate cancer. The urologist said that he had scheduled appointments for me with several doctors over the next few months to get a clear understanding of my condition. During those summer months, I shared my condition with men of Antioch, and I received their recommendation on treatments that they had undergone. I had no clue how serious my condition was. I now believe that without being admitted to the hospital when I was, it is likely that I could have gone on for months without knowing that I had a massive cancer growing in my body. God is good, and he works in strange ways. On September 4th, again 2019, another call from my urologist revealed that the test I had participated in during the summer showed that the cancer had spread to my lungs. One doctor's report said that the number of cancerous nodules in my lungs was too many to count. After considering what I had been told, I'll admit that I had a pity party. Why me? Why now? Truthfully, I'll admit that my pity party didn't last more than a few minutes. I began to think about my Lord and Savior and the life He had allowed me to live. I also thought that no matter what was in my future, He would carry me through. I remember that the prayers lifted up while I was in the hospital did not address the most dire conditions affecting my body. People in the hospital room prayed for the lesser of my health problems while God used my situation to bring to light a serious condition. Medical treatment for the cancer started two days later and continues even now. After eight months of treatment, the prostate cancer nodules in my lungs were gone and the cancer was described as in remission. God's journey for me didn't stop with treatment for prostate cancer. In June of last year, my attempt to get treated for what I thought was extreme fatigue resulted in another hospital stay. After being admitted, I was left alone in an exam room. The call button fell from my bed, and I had no way of contacting anyone for help. After what seemed like an hour, I began experiencing what I will describe as whole body pain. I yelled for help, and nobody heard me. The pain was so extreme that I passed out, screaming Jesus' name. I was told the next day that I had undergone a bone biopsy and that the diagnosis this time was a condition called multiple myeloma. Myeloma is a blood or bone marrow cancer. This time I didn't think about, nor did I participate in a pity party. This time I was encouraged by God's words recorded in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Since my myeloma diagnosis, my doctors required that I submit to weekly blood draws followed by adjustments to prescribe medication. The disease and medication leave my immune system and my body physically weak. Several weeks ago, I got news that my condition was improving. My doctor changed my routine from weekly blood draws and medication adjustments to biweekly. Prior to my diagnosis, I had never heard of the condition called multiple myeloma. 
Since then, I've learned that multiple myeloma is an incurable cancer of a person's white plasma cells. That's those cells that fight infection, and it can permanently weaken bones and damage organs. Afro-Americans have twice the risk of developing multiple myeloma when compared to white Americans. Having two different forms of cancer doesn't scare me, for I know in whom I have believed. I want to thank you, Annie Ock, for giving me this opportunity to share how God has been working in the life of my family. Whew, you said it. And there to be somebody who believe it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Deacon Green, God, Deacon Green, you're in our hearts and in our prayers. And if you ever, he said he was sticking to his script because of time and stand on, on his subject. But if you ever want a testimony, he said, why me? But he uses his testimony to share with others. So if you ever feeling down, just seek him out. What a beautiful family in the greens. So as we continue with our celebration, we're gonna talk to God in prayer. We're gonna lift up the pillows for the nation. We have several of our distinguished men, uh, members who are going to talk on each prayer, who's gonna pray on each pillow. Sister Deaconess, sorry, Deaconess, <laughs> former Deaconess, Sister Witcher is gonna pray for the church, the healthcare, and for the uh, workers as well as the providers. Deacon Samuel Harris is gonna pray for our government and military. Sister Gwen is going to pray for family and education. Brother Julius Caesar is going to pray for business. And Sister Marie Purnell is gonna pray for media. And after our prayers, we're gonna meditate on those prayers by listening to Heal Our Land, a different rendition by Dee Dee Garrett. At this time, will you come? Please bow with me and pray. I praise thee, O Lord, for you alone are worthy of glory, honor, and praise. We come with humble hearts, admitting and confessing our sins of faithlessness, prayerlessness, and disobedience. For you alone know how often and how much we have sinned and fallen from your grace. We thank you, O Lord, for forgiving and cleansing us from all unrighteousness and providing for our daily needs. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to pray for your church, healthcare workers, and other workers. In Matthew 16, 18, you told Peter, upon this rock you would build your church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Precious Lord, you are the rock, and we as a church body come together collectively and fervently, praying for a powerful move of the Holy Spirit to impact the world for Christ. Help us to grow in our knowledge of you and your word. We need your spirit to sharpen us so we can encourage, love, and help each other to grow in faith so we can go, go to evangelize the world. Father, the church faces many challenges today in this post-pandemic period, but we trust you. Please fill pastors, church leaders, and church members with power from the Holy Spirit to share the gospel in and outside of the walls of church buildings in a way that are biblical, relevant, and creative. Equip us to compel and lead men, women, and children to come to a saving knowledge of you. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken and help us as a collective body of believers to lead the world in loving, caring for our neighbors, nation, communities, country, and the world. We promise, dear Father, to join in evangelizing wherever you place us or to generously give to send others if we cannot go. Place a fiery hedge of protection around the church to shield us from the enemy of our soul who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy 
through division, confusion, scandals, and favoritism. We want everyone to know that we are Christians because of our love. Let us be sought and light in this dark and dying world. Now, Lord, I ask for your special blessings on this local branch of Zion, Antioch Baptist Church. Father, starting at the head, we ask for godly wisdom and understanding, preaching and teaching power, good health, strength, and encouragement for our transitional pastor, Reverend Gaines, for Reverend Jones, the ministerial staff, deacons, deaconess, trustees, ministry leaders, and church volunteers. Remind us daily to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. Please, Jehovah, give Antioch Baptist Church wisdom about how to win souls and how to encourage and build each other up and equip the saints here in Fairfax Station and in the metropolitan area. Stir up the gifts of members and nudge them to use what you've given to serve others and the community. Remind us that we are your ambassadors. Bless the impact this church has on surrounding neighborhoods, businesses, and schools. Let the light of our love be pervasive and persuasive. Dear Lord, we plead for the binding up and casting out of ungodly influences so that pure unity and community abound in this church. Father, you and you alone know the plans for Antioch Baptist Church. Help us to seek your face as you lead and guide us and make it clear who you desire to be the next senior pastor. Start orchestrating circumstances, hearts, minds, and resources to prepare your servant to lead with love, to teach and preach your word with power, to admonish and encourage this flock. Let your perfect will be done. Now, I humbly bow before you, praying for health care workers. It's your desire, Father, that we prosper and be in exceptional health. We give thanks to all of those who answered the call to care for the sick in body and in mind. My Lord, we know that many health care workers are so weary of the impact of COVID-19. Encourage them and provide for all their needs. Remind each healthcare worker that in serving others, they are serving you. Restore the care in healthcare by giving healthcare workers a supernatural infusion of your spirit. Let them radiate love, kindness, patience, and joy as they care for the sick. Protect and strengthen their bodies and minds. And may your favor be showered upon them guarding them against illnesses so they can continue to care for others. Protect their families and their homes also from diseases. Use them to bring glory today through their actions, words, and through skillful and pleasant bedside manners. Help them to view the work that they do as a blessing. Remind them that their hands and their feet belong to you. Give them grace and strength for the hardest parts of their job. Lastly, precious Savior, shower blessings upon workers in every area of occupation. Call all Christian workers to remember that we are to work as unto the Lord. Remind us to work as if you're standing nearby watching because you are, and that we will one day give an account for our work here on earth. All wise God, you know some jobs are just hard by the nature of the job or because of unreasonable bosses, expectations, or difficult co-workers. Give us the capacity to see the blessings in difficult jobs, bosses, and co-workers, and meet each of these with prayer and gentleness of spirit. Equip us as Christian workers by giving us that peace that surpasses understanding, strength, courage, godly understanding, and good health. Help us to be sought and light hope and be a living epistle in our places of work. Let us be the ones that demonstrate trustworthiness, reliability, efficiency, self-control, and wisdom in how to manage in difficult situations. Help us to avoid, dra avoid drama, gossip, or confusion, and to be truly peacemakers. For blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they shall be called the children of God. Continually remind us workers daily that we are your children and to be thankful for our jobs. Have mercy on us and help us not to complain, remembering that our jobs are a gift from you and a platform for advancing the gospel. Let how we perform our jobs give glory, honor, and praise to you. We commit all these prayers with humble hearts and believing faith in the precious name of the Holy One, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I will pray for the government and military. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning asking for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace to rain down upon us in, in accordance with your will. Father God, we come to lift up our national government and military to you this morning. From the President of the United States to the lowest officials and workers in the government, we also lift up our military forces to you, Lord, from the four-star generals down to the foot soldier, airman, sailor, and marine. Lord, touch the heart, mind, and soul of the government and military leaders this morning and strengthen their resolve to execute their responsibilities in a manner pleasing to you and in accordance with your will for this great nation. Let our government and military leaders know that you are the one that allowed them to rise to the positions of power that they have today. You are the God that raises up earthly kings and kingdoms to do your will and fulfill your promises. And as swiftly as you raise up kings and kingdoms, in the blink of an eye, you can humble them to the point of wiping out the evidence of their very existence. Oh Lord, you are a great God. Lord, let our, our government and military leaders know that you are the God that is in control of this nation's destiny, not them, no matter what their position, rank, or earthly privilege. You, Lord, will always have the final say. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders your son Jesus' shoulders and not man's shoulders. So Lord, we come to you this morning proclaiming your sovereignty and power over this nation and the entire universe for all eternity. Lord, let our government and military leaders know that they are merely clay in the hands of the Creator God. Let them know, Lord, that only the God of the universe has the power to save this nation and its citizens. And Lord, we pray for a revival to take place at every level of our government and military, a revival that brings us closer to you, Lord God, and your will for this nation. For this we pray in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you with heartfelt gratitude for the privilege of bringing our concerns to you and for all you've done for us, especially for the gift of your son, Jesus. Lord, we offer prayers to you today on behalf of education and families. Thank you for creating within each of us the capacity for learning and blessing us with educators who serve students and the communities in which they reside. For the times in which we live, we ask that you give every teacher the wisdom and foresight to recognize the needs and the potential of all students, expand their creativity, innovation, and passion to teach each student according to their individual needs and learning capabilities. We lift up to you all educational administrators 
give these individuals the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding needed to make sound decisions in the best interest of students, staff, and faculty. Give them the fortitude to offer their valuable insights and act as mediators to represent students' best interest when school boards and parents don't agree on school policies or strategic decisions. We pray for peace and unity in the classroom among students and for harmony to prevail each day. Help all educators to restore the joy of learning and hope in situations where academic success appears to be out of reach. Help teachers and administrators to remain vigilant against violence, keeping our schools safe for students and creating an environment where all students can learn and flourish. And now, dear Lord, we want to express our gratitude to you for giving us families. We ask for your protection over them. Let no trouble fall on them. Allow no evil to influence their hearts. We pray that everything we do within our families will bring you glory. Help us to love and respect each other. Show us how to support and encourage one another. Help us show our children by our actions and our words that they are loved. Inspire us to work together to become a picture full of your perfect love. We ask you to always be the center of our family relationships. Let your spirit fill our hearts so we can love each other just as Christ loves us. Make our homes safe, sanctuaries of blessing, comfort, and love. Let us make family prayer a priority. Mend broken relationships within each circle and let the love we have for one another never run dry. Allow all the lost ones who have been led astray by the world discover you again. Bless our families with peace and preserve the bond that we have as a family. We ask all of these things in your precious name. Amen. Before I pray, I'd like to um, us just to reflect on business for a minute. It's not necessarily specifically called out in the Bible, but I learned in ABI from Reverend Hardin that God created three great institutions, marriage, the church, and government. But underpinning that is certainly is business and prosperity. Everyone that's listed in the Bible had a profession. Lydia dealt in purple. Uh, Luke, the, the physician. Uh, if you look at uh, Job, he was wealthy and had cattle. And we talk about cattle on a thousand hills. So um, business is very important. Our current GDP of, and of our nation, and Lord is, is uh, behind nations, is currently 20 trillion, a little bit over. China's is 19 trillion. The Lord balances nations and everything, and one of the instruments is through business. So uh, I'd just like us to, one, reflect on that, but that God is in control. You know, we've got inflation that's rampant. We've had food shortages, and it affected one of my granddaughters because we didn't have the supplies and everything like that in business. So I'd like us to reflect that God is a God of business. So let us go before the throne. Dearly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for our ability to be able to work, Father, for our health and for our strength, Lord. We pray for our business leaders. We pray for our government leaders, Lord, uh, in the Federal Reserve and in Treasury, Lord, that to give them the wisdom, Father, as they control our economy. We pray, Lord, for those that are in academia, Lord, that those that are in industry and those that are in government, we pray for for-profit and non-profit organizations from the CEO, Father, to be able to treat their employees well, Father, and not just be about ill-gotten gains or greed, Father. And we also pray for those that are on the shop floor, Father, that are doing your will, that they work as if into the Lord, Father. We pray that the folks that, that when opportunities come, that they recognize that those opportunities come from you, Jesus, that they come from you in order to prosper your people, Lord. We also pray for all the materials that are needed, Lord, 
All of the earth is yours, Father, and we just pray for our great nation, Lord, that we continue in a trajectory that's towards you and that we bow our heads towards you and that our businesses do that as well, Father. This we ask in your name. Amen. I stand before you today to pray for media. Let us go to the Father. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for giving this, this platform, Heavenly Father, so that we can come before you, Lord, publicly, declaring your name. Heavenly Father, we just uh, pray for media, Lord, and globally, Lord. It's, uh, we pray for all the written, we pray for the video virtual. We pray for the audio and everything that goes across the airways, Heavenly Father. We know that through the pandemic that we've had, Lord, that you know you have raised up the ability to uh, reach more people via media, Heavenly Father. We just thank you for that, Heavenly Father. We just thank you that you know that we can uh, reach others for Christ across the airways, across the TV, across the written word, Heavenly Father. Lord, we just thank you for media, Lord, that we were able today to have a testimony from a saint, Heavenly Father, that went out to the world, Heavenly Father, to let you know and to declare that you are God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you um, in this church, Heavenly Father, for the media team that we have, that through the pandemic, Lord, that we were able to share the gospel and the goodness of you, Heavenly Father, and the things that you needed for us. Lord, we just ask that we bind all the negative aspects of media, Lord, you know, and how it is being used to slander people, to bully people, to uh, share with the immorality of things, Heavenly Father. But we know that you are a great God and that you will lift us up above all those things. And we know that if we are to uh, be a better person, a better uh, group of people, Lord, that it is that way through media that we're going to be able to share the gospel of you. Lord, again, we ask that you pray. I pray for the media team here at Antioch. Lord, they work very hard to make sure that we have sound, we have video, and that we're able to share in our local area the things that we need to do. We thank you, Lord, and we honor you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi, this song is titled Heal Our Land. And of course it is um, coming from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter seven and 14, where it simply says that if we, his people who are called by his name will humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways and seek his face. Then he will hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sins and he'll heal our land. He Can't 
do it without you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Make it your prayer. Oh. If we God's people who will call by his name would humble ourselves and pray if we'll turn turn from our wicked ways and seek our father's face he said he would hear from heaven and forgive our sins and he said he would heal he said he would heal he said he said he would hear from heaven and forgive our sins. He said he would heal. Make it a crumb from your heart now. Heal. We need you, Lord. We pray to thee. You're the
return to you. We do it now, love. Best weapon we have against Satan is prayer. And we just want to thank all of our prayer warriors for sharing so passionately with us today. So now I have the honor of introducing our speaker for today. This is a very intro easy introduction because we're very good friends with this family. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. Reverend Horton accepted Christ in 1957. Now I noticed it didn't say what age he was in 1957, but he said it was 1957. He received a Master of Divinity from Samuel Dewitt Proctor School of Theology, where he graduated cum laude. He is a retired decorated U.S. Air Force officer with over 30 years of uh, distinguished service. He comes to us from Miami, Florida. He has a wife, Taylor, Dr. Taylor Harding, and one daughter named Janelle, and two grandchildren. Reverend Harden serves here at Antioch as an associate pastor, sorry, associate minister, and he and his wife, Dr. Harding, are co-founders, co-founding directors of ABI, the Antioch Bible Institute. He walks his walk, and he can be seen with his Facebook inspirations that encourages others throughout. At this time, please prepare to receive the message and our speaker of the hour, Reverend Harding. I was just a baby, <laughs> a little baby. Good morning. It's always a blessing to <clears throat> stand before God's people, stand with God, God's people as we all stand before him. Um, I'd like to greet our Pastor Gaines, all the ministers, all the members, those who are viewing virtually, and of course, acknowledge my wife. And uh, God knows that uh, I probably wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for her. But she's been, uh, this is our 47th year, and God's been good. God's been good. Uh, for the sake of time, let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, I actually could just put my remarks away. Uh, you all have said everything that I had in my heart to say this morning. You know, early African Christians, uh, uh, converts, um, were earnest and regular prayer warriors, uh, they, in both their private and uh, public uh, prayer. Each one had a separate spot in the bush where they would go and pray each day. Over time, the paths to these areas that they would go back into the bush to pray 
became worn from them going there day after day after day. And it soon uh, there was a point where uh, uh, they began, to, it, it, was, it was very noticeable to, to their friends if they began to slack off praying. And they would say to them, the grass grows on your path. But when they slacked off on praying, the grass would begin to grow because they weren't using their paths to prayer. Sidlow Baxter wrote, people may, be, may spurn our appeals and reject our message, oppose our arguments, despise us as persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. Hopefully, uh, we all know that we are here today to talk a little bit about prayer. Prayer is a divine privilege and the most powerful weapon available to, in the uh, Christian arsenal. Hebrew 4.16 says, through prayer, God allows us to draw near his throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. God has promised to hear us when we call on him and to answer our prayers and pray, when we pray according to his will. There are unique blessings and much power available through regular prayer. Now, prayer can be corporate or it can be uh, private. Uh, it can be private and personal, or it can be congregational, as we're doing here this morning. Hopefully, as God's people, we regularly practice both public and private prayer. Can you remember a time when you went to God in prayer and he answered your petition? There's something personal and comforting about entering God's presence and talking with him in fervent, sacred prayer. If we want to see lives changed and souls saved, we have to pray. If we want to impact families, communities, our country, and the world, we need to pray. There's real power in prayer. Today's text shows us that the true power of, shows us the, the true power of earnest prayer. There's a divinely supernatural dynamic that occurs when God's children come together, united in faith, focus, and purpose, seeking God's face in prayer. Our core text this morning will come from the book of Acts. Acts 12, uh, we're going to look at all of Acts, or pretty much all of Acts 12, but I want to read into your hearing just verses 1 through 5. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by by four squads of four soldiers each, 16 people. Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial after the Passover. Verse five, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Master. We, do, we pray, Father, that we do no harm to your word. I pray, my Lord, that you are glorified through it all, Master. Be glorified in the heavens. Be glorified in the earth, Father. Be glorified in me, through me, and by me. We love you, Lord, and we trust you. In the name of Jesus, amen. A subject for the morning is a praying church. A praying church. As our text unfolds, we see that Herod Agrippa I was actively persecuting the newly formed Christian church. Ironically, it was at Antioch. Verse 2 tells us that Herod had already beheaded James, the brother of John, and when he saw how that pleased the Jewish religious leaders, he then seized Peter, and was, who was at that time head of the Christian church. You know, there's always, there are always those who don't want to see the church grow. 
and will do whatever they can to delay or stop the church's agenda. So we have to pray continually. Herod was a typical politician who worked hard to please the masses and cultivate the goodwill of the Jews. He shrewdly ruled by keeping the Mosaic law and all the Jewish holidays and observances. That worked well for him and he became very popular with the Jews, especially the religious leaders. But don't get it twisted, he didn't do that because he loved Jews. No, he had been appointed king by Rome and he truly wanted to please his Roman superiors. They wanted to have happy, cooperative, quiet Jews. So Herod worked hard to keep the Jews quiet and happy and in line. He was good at his job and popular with both the Romans and the Jews. Now, after Peter was arrested in jail, Herod thought if, if he killed the head of the church, the Christian body would soon die. Don't you know that mentality exists today? Church leaders are still under attack. Herod actually wanted to kill Peter right away, so uh, uh, don't think that him keeping him in jail and delaying his execution was some so, sort of act of kindness. No, this was just a, the case of Herod, Herod's cunning desire to remain popular with the Jewish leaders respecting Passover. Our text says that Peter was arrested during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is Passover, and by Jewish law, no trial or executions could take place during that week. So Herod could not kill Peter until Passover week was over or he would lose his popularity. That popularity that he, that he had uh, gained with the Jews by arresting Peter in the first place. They were just happy, the religious leaders were just happy that Peter was in jail. What Herod didn't know was that God had other plans. I praise God that he can turn what looks to be a dead end into a detour and take what could be the, seems like the end of the road and turn it into just the bend in the road. He'll make our enemies behave. Acts 12 is a clear example of God's divine choices. Now, the church had been praying for both James and Peter. They surely had prayed as fervently for James as they did for Peter. But in verses 9 through 10, we see that Peter was, was freed after uh, being in jail for, uh, 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 for a bit. All right? But James was killed. It's said by the sword. He had been beheaded. Was there something wrong with how the church had prayed for James as opposed to how they prayed for Peter? Had they used the wrong words of the script of, uh, or scriptures, the wrong themes or rituals? Was their faith not strong enough? Did God love Peter more than he loved James? Of course, the answer to all of these questions is no. But Christians are still asking the same kinds of questions today whenever we see God working his divine will in our lives and situations. But God can do whatever he chooses, whenever he chooses, however he chooses. God loved James and Peter equally, but the church didn't let the prior execution of James keep them from earnestly, can the church say earnestly? Earnestly praying on behalf of Brother Peter. Let's look at the church's prayer in verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly, earnestly praying to God for him. Peter definitely needed earnest prayer because he was in a terrible spot. But don't, don't miss that tiny word there in verse 5, that, that tiny little conjunction uh, that makes all the difference. It's that little conjunction, but. The situation looked desperate, but. It looked like Peter might be put to death, but it looked like the fragile new church might be destroyed before it could carry the gospel to the world. But facing overwhelming odds, Peter's church bowed its collective head as one, as one united body and called on God. They didn't cower in fear before the enemies. They lifted their combined voices and prayed to God who heard their prayers and used his awesome power to free Peter. But Peter's church didn't pray just any old prayer. The text says it was an earnest prayer. 
The word earnest in Acts 12 has the same meaning as the word fervent in James 5, 16. That's, that says the effective fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Those two words are both defined as passionate, intense, enthusiastic, burning, zealous. If we want our prayers to have power and to be effective, we must pray earnestly and fervently. Our prayers can't be sluggish, lifeless, unfeeling, casual, half-hearted, blasé, and just any old thing. Fervent prayer passionately pours forth from a burdened, humble, but thankful heart. That kind of prayer reaches heaven and moves the heart and the hand of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. I firmly believe that that's how the church prayed for Peter. Effective, fervent prayer was made without ceasing. Don't overlook the phrase without ceasing, which in this text means to stretch forth. It almost had a medical connotation uh, that, 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 said, that, that implied going beyond the usual boundaries, the usual boundaries. When applied to the prayer of Peter's church, these words depict urgency. We see people passionately, passionately, passionately pouring out their hearts before God with intensity, without ceasing. There are big advantages and benefits and rewards available in response to effective, fervent prayer. The church's prayer wasn't uh, just earnest, but faithful. Hebrew eleven sixteen says, without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who, there's that word, earnestly seek him. Earnestly seek him. God is not just a spectator. He, he, he's a divine participant and the object of our prayers. When we pray, we have to offer thankful, worshipful, praise-filled petitions, believing, knowing that he will faithfully keep his word. Now, God will always hear us, no matter how we pray, uh, it, it's, it's not our eloquent words, and, and it, uh, it's all about our hearts. It's all about our hearts. Romans 8.26 says, For we do not know, for we do, we do not know what to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. When we don't know what to say, just groan. Just groan, and the Holy Spirit will pray for us. Just thinking about all that he is and all that he's already done for us should cause us to offer fervent, faithful, passionate, earnest prayers. Luke twenty two forty four 44 says, Jesus prayed in the garden the night before his crucifixion as being in agony. He prayed more earnestly, more earnestly. There's that word again. That's how we should pray. Have you ever prayed like that? Preta's church united in faith, focus, and purpose. They joined their hearts and voices to faithfully, fervently, and earnestly pray to God as one body on behalf of Brother Peter. When we pray, we are talking directly to our Father. He, he delights in hearing and answering the prayers of his children. Luke 12, 32 says, Do not fear. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's God's good pleasure to answer our prayers. The prayer of Peter's church was not only fervent and faithful, it was focused prayer. It, uh, uh, there again in verse 5b, it says prayer was made for him. Prayer was made for Peter. Peter was the sole focus of their prayer. They united to pray for one specific purpose, one need. They wanted their brother delivered. We don't need themes. We need focus. We need focus. When we pray and God answers, it pleases and glorifies him. Prayer should stand as a witness of our relationship with him. Hmm. Reassuring us that of his love and his faithfulness, and also enriching our testimonies to others, when we can go out and tell the, uh, the world about 
how God has answered our prayers. First Peter 5, 7 tells us that to cast all of our cares on him, for he cares for us. He wants us to bring everything to him in prayer. We can ask him for exactly and specifically what we need, and, uh, uh, and he's faithful to answer. Today, there are people in our families, in our church, in our community, and in our nation facing great storms in their lives. They, they may need healing, guidance, deliverance, direction. Some are struggling with tough family issues, personal needs, burdens, and problems. Today, let's think about the names and faces and issues of some people that we may know, some people that we may not know. Pray for our church, pray for our community and the lost souls of the world. Pray for our nation and national leaders. Pray for God's direction as we seek a new pastor. Pray for me if you can't think of anything else to pray for as I pray for you every day. We all need prayer. It glorifies God when we call on him. Now there's some holy things that happen when we pray. Verse six shows that we experience God's peace when we pray. Can your church say peace? peace? Herod had already executed James. Now, Peter was sitting on death row, scheduled to be tried and executed the very next morning. But what was he doing? He wasn't pleading for freedom. He wasn't uh, writing his last will and testament. He wasn't crying or screaming or begging for mercy. The night before he was to die, Peter was sleeping in his prison cell like a newborn baby. Verse 7 says, Peter slept right through the angel coming into, in and the light shining all around him in his prison cell. The angel had to strike him to wake him up. He may have been bound by chains between two soldiers, but he was sound asleep. He didn't have a care in the world. God had given Peter that peace that surpasses all understanding. It's too bad that more of God's people don't have that kind of peace in their lives. It seems the least little thing can send us reeling into fear, panic, anxiety, even worry. If we want Peter's peace today, try prayer. As the hymn writer says, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pains we bear, all because we do not carry everything everything, some things, everything to God in prayer. Besides God's peace, prayer brings God's protection. Can the church say protection? Peter's church didn't know uh, what the future held, so there was great fear and concern for the survival of the struggling new Christian church. After all these new Christians had left their families and all of their lives that they knew, all, they left all of their Jewish roots to follow Jesus. Verse 6 tells us that Herod was about to bring Peter to trial. He had bad plans for Brother Peter, but he didn't realize that even as himself as king, he was merely a human instrument of satanic evil, only an actor in God's divine plan. Herod and the guards thought Peter was their prisoner, but God was actually using them for Peter's protection while he took a nap. Satan had organized and empowered this persecution because he hated the church. He hated the gospel that, uh, being preached, and he hated Christ being worshipped. So he stirred up his forces and sent them against the people of God. Today we're still under satanic attack. Never think that we are immune to his assaults. As long as Satan roams this world, he'll do anything and everything in his power to disturb, disrupt, and destroy the unity and effectiveness of God's church. We must always be on God. Satan feels that if he can turn us against one another, he can stop God's work. He thinks that if he can fill us with fear of the daily attacks from society, he can stop us from spreading the gospel of Jesus. But he's a liar. Today, the world is hostile to our message and has little use for us or the gospel we preach. We are challenged like never before. The only churches that seem to be growing are those that are embracing a politically correct agenda, a world-pleasing message. 
Fundamentalist churches are still, that still cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ and preach biblically sound doctrines and principles as a foundation of our faith and worship are rapidly dying up, drying up. If there was ever a time that God's church needed prayer or needed his divine protection, we sure do need it now. Now, when we pray, we experience not only his peace and protection, we also uh, invite his presence. Can we say presence? Verse 7 reveals God's presence. As Peter lay there sleeping, the angel of the Lord came right into his cell. Not, not even the bars and the locks and the guards and the walls could keep God from rescuing his servant. When we find ourselves in the prisons of anxiety, grief, loneliness, despair, or other trials of life, we need to know with certainty that God will never leave us alone. Just pray and believe that he's with you in every trial and along every mile. He'll never let us down. For those who may think that uh, they don't know how to pray, remember this little story called an empty chair. An empty chair. A daughter asked a local pastor to visit and pray with her father when he uh, pray with her father. When he arrived, he found the man lying in bed, uh, propped up on two pillows, uh, and an empty chair sitting next to the bed. The pastor saw the empty chair and assumed that the old man the old man knew he was coming and had placed the chair there for him. And uh, the pastor said, "I guess uh, you were expecting me." The man said, "No. Who are you?" I'm the new associate pastor at the church, he said. When I saw the empty chair, I figured you knew I was coming, and the chair was for me. Oh, yeah, the chair, said the old man. Pastor, would you mind closing the door? Puzzled, the pastor shut the door. The old man said, I've never told anyone this, not even my daughter. But all my life, I've never known how to pray. At church, I heard the preacher talk about prayer, but it was always went right over my head, and I was too ashamed to ask him how to do it, so I didn't try to pray anymore. Then one day, about four years ago, my best friend told me, Joe, prayer is just having a conversation with Jesus. He suggested I sit down and place an empty chair in front of me, and, and in faith, picture Jesus sitting in that chair. It seemed a little spooky, but I knew Jesus had promised to always be with us. My friend told me to talk to Jesus the same way I was doing to him right then. So I tried it, and I liked it so much that I still do it a few times every day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter ever saw me talking to an empty chair, she'd either have a nervous breakdown or she'd send me to the funny farm. The pastor was deeply moved by this story, and he told Joe to just continue his daily talks with Jesus, like always. Then he prayed with Joe and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to say that her daddy had died earlier that day. The pastor asked, did he seem to die in peace? Yes, she said. When I left around 2 o'clock, he called me over to his bedside and told me one of his corny jokes and kissed me on the cheek. But when I returned about an hour later, he was gone. But there was something very strange. In fact, it was beyond strange. It was really kind of weird. Apparently, just before Dad died, he had leaned over and rested his head in that empty chair beside his bed. The pastor knew that the old man was now resting with Jesus. Antioch praying is just as simple as having a little talk with Jesus. As God's children, whenever we need him, just call on him, lean on him, rest in him in prayer. Finally, our text reveals that prayer not only brings peace, protection, and presence, but we, when we pray, we also experience God's power. Verses 6 through 11 tell us that when uh, Peter's church prayed, God heard them and answered their earnest, fervent prayers. Through his power, he miraculously delivered Peter 
from prison because Peter was his servant and because the church had asked him to save Peter. There's wonder working power in a praying church. Ephesians 3.20 says that he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or think. His power has no limit. Acts, the, uh, verses 12 through 17 in this Acts 12 also show that sometimes we may be shot mm, but must not be surprised at when and how God moves. Be shot but don't be surprised. When Peter was released from prison, he went to Mary's house uh, where the church was uh, meeting in prayer. He knocked on the gate and Rhoda came out to answer. When she heard Peter's voice, she rushed back in to tell the church that he was outside. But the people didn't believe her. They, they assumed that Peter was still in jail or that he was dead. This had to be an angel at the gate. Warren Worsby says God could get Peter out of prison, but Peter couldn't get himself into that prayer meeting. When the people investigated, they discovered that it really was Peter himself. And the text says they were astonished, astonished. They were, why were they so amazed? After all, hadn't they been praying for his release? They were surprised because they were just like us. They had faith that God could deliver Peter, but they didn't trust that God would deliver Peter. They had faith that God could deliver Peter, but they didn't trust that God would deliver Peter. Faith isn't belief without proof, but trust without doubt. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus said, For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here. Move from here to there, and it will move. Can someone pass these around and make sure that everyone gets one? Anyone? I hope there's enough for everyone. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. When we pray, we may sometimes be astonished at how God moves and answers our prayers. But let's not worry about having big faith. Let's develop simple childlike faith. What you are receiving is a mustard seed. If you've never seen one, that's a mustard seed. God wants us to have mustard seed faith. Apart from God, we can do nothing. All we need to experience God's peace, his protection, his presence, and his power is to fervently, earnestly, and faithfully seek our Lord in focused prayer with mustard seed faith. Remember the most effective and underused tool available to God's people since the days of Peter for communing with our Father is through prayer. Seek him today, saints and experience his peace, his protection, his presence, and his power. I tell you, church, something miraculous happens when the people of God pray. Let's be a praying church. God bless you. Good morning, church. It's one thing I know, and that prayer changes things. I know that all of us are here today and online as a result of prayer. Somebody prayed for me. Somebody labored. Mama cried through those prayers. The preacher cried through those prayers. And prayer is what makes a difference in our lives. And so we thank God for this wonderful prayer, National Day of Prayer, because the nation needs prayer. And that prayer must start here in the community where we are and spread all the way nationally uh, that God will influence our leaders, our schools, uh, the law enforcement all around this country. Prayer is needed. So we are so thankful to be able to do this on this day uh, before Antioch is a praying church. 
And I'm glad to be in a praying church. Amen. So we're going to prepare to close out today, and we just want to thank all of you for coming out uh, on this beautiful day. We want to thank Linnell for just leading and guiding us through this service today. God bless you. Thank you so much. Job well done. Thank you. Thank you. And Reverend Harden, thank you for that wonderful message. God bless you. And, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, call out our dear friend, Reverend Kopich, who uh, obviously spearheads the National Day of Prayer for us. God bless you, Mike. My good friend, my mentor. Thank you for just leading the charge on this National Day of Prayer. And thank God for all of you being here on this morning. I'm going to ask if you're able to let us stand as we prepare to close out in prayer. Uh, and just giving God thanks and uh, praise for what he has done here today. Let us go before the Lord. Oh dear God, now we thank you now. We thank you for this prayer service, Lord God. We thank you for those who are here in this place. We thank you for those who joined us virtually, Lord God. We thank you for this nation. We thank you for all the prayer requests that came forth from our pillars, Lord God. We ask that you bless those prayers, Lord God, that you would honor those prayers as you've always done, Lord God. We thank you for the message and the messenger today, Lord God. Continue to use him in a mighty way, Lord God. And God, we thank you for this, this body called Antioch, that you would continue to strengthen us, guide us, and encourage us to go out and touch this world, Lord God, with the power of your word. As we, as we seek to change this world. And now, Lord God, as we prepare to leave this place but never your presence, we pray for your t t uh, continued guidance. And God, if you allow us to wake up tomorrow morning, we wake up giving you the praise, the glory, and the honor is in Christ's magnificent name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you.